Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? So thinking about coming here to talk to a group about restorative justice, I, I feel like I always have to start by saying that sometimes when I think about restorative justice, it's like in terms of a three-day training, right? So um, you're getting, you know, like we talk about having the nickel, dime, and quarter version, you're getting like the penny version. That's how, a little bit about how it feels in terms of an overview. I'd be curious just to know how many of you have heard the term restorative justice before. Oh, quite a few, good. So hopefully that means you're um, familiar with what was the Center for Community uh, Peacemaking in Lancaster, that's now ADVOS. Um, one of the things that I participated in um, a number of years ago, back when that program started in the, in the early 80s, was having conversations to start uh, what was then uh, LaVorp. And so I was part of that original planning committee. So it's really wonderful. I've, I've moved away and come back to this area, but it's really wonderful to see where that organization has gone locally. And so, you know, I would encourage you, if you want more information, that that is also a place to start as well. And um, I just feel like I need to put in a plug to say they're always looking for new volunteers for the endeavors that they're involved in. So when I talk about restorative justice, I'm gonna start by just saying, um, it's, it's a river fed by many different streams. And that's how I feel. When I would have first started um, in the work that I did in restorative justice, we didn't even call it that. Um, I worked in uh, Elkhart, Indiana, which was the first victim offender uh, reconciliation program uh, in the US that was started. And for some, so we refer to it as VORP. In many communities, they talk about victim offender mediation, victim offender conferencing. So you hear many different languages for the same kind of things. But restorative justice has spread, I would say, far and wide beyond that. That's still at the core of much of the work that's being done in restorative justice, working with issues of victims, offenders, and communities when a crime has been committed. But, uh, but we'll talk about some of the other places where it's also been recognized. So a river fed by many streams. So one of those is just the recognition of the limits of the legal system. And, and so not to say that in any way, in, in a critical manner, uh, our legal system is there for a purpose, and I, I agree with that. I work within the legal system. And I would say that for some, um, I think, who haven't heard about restorative justice think, well, that's just people out to abolish the legal system. And, and I would say that in no way uh, at least not for me, is that something that I would advocate because I think it's certainly necessary. Um, but it's also, you know, but there's some, can, we can critique that. We can critique that which we love as well. So we talk about that in terms of prisons. Um, you know, what are the limitations to prisons? Uh, some, of, some of the work that we've done is coming out of some of that recognition. It's also out of the victim's rights movement. I would say that when I first started in this field and I was in Elkhart doing victim offender dialogues, I can remember um, contacting victims because they've been referred by the legal system because someone has been through the legal system and been convicted and so they need, one of the options is to meet with the victim of crime. And so I can remember contacting victims and saying, I'm calling from the Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. I can tell you my voice was not always a welcome one that they wanted to hear. Uh, they at some times would say, I didn't even know anyone was arrested. So, you know, we were starting to do this work before we really knew about victim rights, before victims' rights became much more active. Um, I would say over the years there's been tension because sometimes with victims' rights they would say, you know, our rights haven't even been recognized and sometimes that scene is taking money from what victims' right advocates think should happen. So I think we can talk about that a lot more, but I think our relationships have certainly changed over the decades that I've been involved in it. Um, so as I talk about some, I, I did my, um, Matt, when I did my master's degree, I worked in a um, victim's right organization in Bucks County, and I said it was one of the best learnings that I could have gotten from my master's program, just learning about the issues faced on a daily basis by those working with victims' needs. I can also talk about it in terms of uh, faith traditions. Um, early on, I, would, I think that um, some of the influences in restorative justice have certainly been within the faith community. Certainly at MCC, it's something we've been committed to for a number of decades. 
Um, before I took on the role of restorative justice coordinator, Howard Zare, who is, uh, if any of you know about restorative justice, would be a name that would be very familiar, who has done a lot of kind of the seminal work around restorative justice. Um, he was in that position before I was, and so that's something that we've been committed to over the decades, and, and coming from that place of faith. And so when I talk about that, and when I use language of reconciliation, that's often where that comes from, and yet not from a place of saying, and I'll talk more about this in a few minutes, but reconciliation doesn't mean that we're going to bring people together and we're going to put them in a room and they're going to walk out and they're going to be best friends. Not necessarily. Um, and so it's providing opportunities for what we think are important dialogues that can happen. So whether that's within crime, whether that's in something that happens, um, one of the areas that, that is being worked on within the medical profession, how does that happen in terms of accountability? How does that happen for patients who want to have these kind of conversations when something hasn't gone well? So not necessarily in a crime. We also talk about it in conflict situations, within schools, within organizations. Um, one of the things that I um, used to say, uh, in my office, um, I used to work primarily just within the legal system. And we also had a separate office, but we shared space, where my colleagues who did some of these dialogues and conflicts within church situations, and we decided at some point that we were using the same restorative justice umbrella and we should be able to do each other's work. They should be able to work in the areas of with victims and offenders of crime, and I should be able to go into church settings. And I remember um, after doing my first church mediation, I came out of that and said to my colleagues, send me to the prison anytime. So I used to say I thought the legal system was difficult to work with until I had to work with churches. Um, and I can say that because I, I, I work with churches now on a regular basis and I love my church. Um, we also talk about it in terms of indigenous traditions. And one of the things is just to recognize that that is that's important. That one of the things when we talk about restorative justice, it wasn't something that we invented, wasn't something that Mennonites came up with, wasn't something that just people of faith came up with, that these are traditions that have been gone before us for generations, for decades, for hundreds of years, not just within the US, not just within Canada, but within countries around the world. And so um, this picture is one actually from uh, when I was in South Korea two years ago. And one of the things they were interested in, I was there for two and a half weeks and they were talking about restorative discipline in schools and what that looks like when you talk about creating caring climates within school settings. And that's particularly, uh, when they invited me, they talked about that because they said the focus is so heavy in their country on academics. Uh, we went through this uh, a small town and there was a huge banner up across the road in this small town and, and it had two names on it and they said those are the two from this town who were chosen to go to the highest the, the esteemed college uh, university in in South Korea and so that's how they honor you know that's the place that academics hold and they said and we've done that um, unfortunately what has suffered are relationships how people get along, how they work at that within the schools. It's, it's very much as they would talk about it in terms of a punishment model. And so the ways that they are working at restorative discipline in schools and talking about restorative justice I, was an inspiration. I felt like I came away from that experience learning more than uh, what I left behind. But one of the things that they use often um, when they're having these discussions is a circle process. And, and everyone brings something to that circle. So that's some of the symbols that people brought to the training that we did. Uh, just to signify that everyone has something to bring. Everyone has something to contribute. And certainly that would be at the essence of restorative justice. That it's not, um, you know, I really appreciate Jim calling me the expert, although, you know, I should say that my understanding of an expert is someone who has to drive within 50 miles, and so I only came from Akron, so you can take that or leave it, but, um, but, but everyone within those processes are experts because they know what they need. So it's important also just to acknowledge kind of these, these, these contributions, these um, tributaries that come into play. Uh, we talk about the mediation movement. Um, early, when we, um, when we first started the, looking at um, Lavorp in Lancaster, one of the, there were a number of us on the planning committee or on the organizing committee, and one person was Grace Byler, who was with the Lancaster Mediation Center. And we talked about, you know, does it make sense to have two different organizations or should we be one? Um, and at that point, um, mediation and talking about dialogues with victim and offenders were two different things. 
We weren't, ta we weren't using kind of that same stream at that moment. We weren't talking about negotiation as we often is a language that we use in mediation. Um, because we felt like victims should not have to negotiate anything. They have been harmed. Uh, this was not something that, uh, you know, two neighbors having a disagreement about what, you know, where the boundary line was. Uh, this was someone who had been harmed. And so we actually formed at that point two separate organizations, which is the way that it was until ADVOS formed, um, and now Lancaster Mediation Center and the Center for Community Peacemaking are together, uh, which is the way the models are going across the country. Part of that is just the understanding that we can, we can talk about it in two different ways, but we know that the overarching principle that what we want to do in creating healthy communities is significant and, and is the goal that we all have. Um, I also mentioned practice before theory just because we were doing this work before we ever knew what to call it, uh, before the name restorative justice even came about. So for many people, they would say, well, we're doing this because it makes sense within our communities. It makes sense that we want to have people talk to one another. It makes sense to have victims and offenders as stakeholders have a, some say in what happens within their process and to have communities involved. And so we were doing that practice and then started started talking about, well, what are best practices? What is the theory behind what some of the work is that we're doing? Um, and we especially had to talk about that as we were talking about schools and, and best practices. One of the things that we um, also uh, had, and I mentioned this earlier, was just questions about the needs of victims, offenders, in the communities. It's one of the questions that we often ask when we think about what does that person need? Um, we, we do a really good job of, of maybe telling people what they need, but we rarely ask them what they need. And so a lot of the work came about asking what those needs are. We can even ask when we think about justice, especially when we're talking about it within the legal system, what does justice require? You know, and that requires asking people questions about what they need and having them be part of that process. One of the early things that we, um, that we used to hear was this uh, about the a traditional legal response. And one that in many ways victims felt left them out, ignored them, left them be a footnote kind of in the process. And so it's this quote that here's what victims are entitled to. They're entitled to a trial of the perpetrator and if found guilty, adequate punishment. And while that may be true, and many victims would agree with that, many of us would agree with that, we can also say, but does that meet the needs of the victim? Is that all that they need? One of the things that happened um, this morning before I came here, I received an email that I haven't responded to yet, but it was someone asking whether I would be in, involved in a process with um, family members, victims of uh, a juvenile who is going up for resentencing because of the new law um, around juvenile uh, serving life without parole. And so asking whether I would be willing to contact that victim's family to talk to them about what their needs are as this juvenile goes up for resentencing. Um, those are, it, it's difficult work and it's difficult often to make those contacts because sometimes victims feel like, are you only asking me because you want me to have a part in something happening good for the offender? And victims should never be used to make something better for the offender. That sounds maybe a little bit harsh, but it's not something that should be put on them. But it's a question we just ask, what are their needs? And how does that get portrayed? How does that get responded to? Um, when I was doing, I do some work, I, I mentioned in restorative discipline in schools, and I remember at one point, one of the things that happened was my son came home from school when he's, uh, he, he's 28 now, uh, and I always get permission from my kids to tell these stories, and some of them are not as flattering. Um, but one of the things, he came home and he said, he didn't come into the house, and I said to his brother and sister, well, where's Jordan? And they said, well, he's outside. And so I went outside and he said to me, Mom, you're going to be so mad at me. My first response, I always say, we talk about what are the restorative responses. My first uh, thought was not a restorative one. Um, and uh, my first thought was to say, what did you do now? Because that was often how it felt with him. Instead, I said to him, tell me what happened. What a different response when we asked that question in a different way, rather than put him on the defensive. And he said he got a five-day detention. So not a suspension, a five-day detention. He had never had one before for five days anyway. And so I again asked him to tell me what happened. And he said he and his, his best friend were playing at recess. 
and he tackled him to get the bag of chips from him and then ran. So they were fighting over this bag of chips, play fighting, as he said. So he got this five-day detention. So with my restorative justice hat on, I called the school, and I talked to the teacher who gave him the detention. And I said, well, what about Kyle, his friend? I said, did you talk to him? And he said, no, I didn't. And I said, well, according to Jordan, this was, this was mutual, and they were playing. I said, but I don't know that for sure. Maybe there was something going on. And maybe there's a problem between these two. And I would like to know and make sure Kyle's being taken care of as well. I'm not saying Jordan shouldn't get a five-day detention. You need to do what you need to do, but I think there are some pieces missing. So he said, I'll talk to him. So he contacted me the next day, and he said, Lorraine, you're right. He said, there, you know, I talked to Kyle, and he said he was a full participant in this. In fact, the recess aide didn't see that he actually knocked Jordan down and took the bag of chips from him. They were playing, and they were arguing over this, and he said, so you were right, and after I talked to him, we decided that we would also give him a five-day detention. So Jordan comes home from school at the end of that day and says, way to go, Mom. So be careful what we wish for when we ask those questions about what people need. But I, uh, in my mind, it was paying attention to the relationship. Um, and yeah, that, they, they maintained their friendship after that, and, um, but it wasn't what they were hoping for. But again, you know, asking those questions about needs, I think, is so important. And I think that's what this call, this email was about this morning. How do we talk to the victim's family and ask them what their needs are, not having them assume, and this is coming from the defense, and so that makes it, because we have an adversarial system, um, so that makes it even more suspicious. Um, why, would a why would the defense want to know what the victim says? And so how do we... You know, how do we navigate that? How do we talk about, because we want healthy communities and we want everyone involved to feel like they have some say in, in, in what happens, how do we do that in healthy ways that doesn't further alienate people when we're talking about it from different sides? So we look at some of the assumptions in terms of the legal system. So we talk about crime is a violation of laws and it's against the state. So it's the commonwealth against someone. Um, it's not necessarily a particular person. It's violations that creates guilt. States determine who is to blame and imposes punishment, which is what we assume to be equal to justice. And I guess that's part of what, uh, some of what we question is how we ask that question. So we ask what laws have been broken and who did it and what do they deserve? That's the, the legal system perspective. And so one of the things that we've talked about in restorative justice is asking a different set of questions about victims' needs. Are they being served? Are offenders being held truly accountable? And are our communities being strengthened? Sometimes when I do victim-offender dialogues, and particularly when I was doing them within the juvenile system, I remember when we talk about accountability that some offenders, when we would say, one option is for you to meet with the person whose home you burglarized. And, and, and there were times when these offenders would look at me like deer in the headlights and like, can I just do like five days in jail? Like wouldn't, that would just be so much easier. So that would be punishment, but is it accountability? So how do we talk about that? And, and I think restorative justice tries to ask some of those questions. Depending on who you have up here speaking, you'll get many different um, responses about the, the definition of restorative justice. Um, I think it's, it's often one of the things we talk about in the field that we, we don't have an agreed upon definition. But one of the things we've been using at MCC probably for the last, I don't know, 12 or 15 years is this definition because it doesn't talk just about victims and offenders because that's not all of the work that we do. When I started doing work in schools, I found out very quickly that I could not refer to people as victims and offenders. I could not refer to students that way when something happened because sometimes it wasn't about that. It was something about their relationship going on or someone who said they were the victim today maybe was the offender yesterday. So. Um, and again, I mean, I think all of that language is stigmatizing, but we particularly don't want to do that uh, in schools. And so we came up with this definition that just talks about the framework and approaches of how we treat people and how we want people to be involved in what happens, how we empower people to be responsible for their actions rather than to automatically come out and say, I didn't do it. Uh, because that's the automatic first response. So how do we try and uphold people to take responsibility for what they've done? And how do we, how do we hold one another accountable? 
for me, that's part of the work um, of what I do, what I'm doing within organizations. I always, um, uh, one of the things I've been in conversation with, there's this uh, justice and peace building series of little books, and there's one on, and I have some of these up here, on victim offender conferencing and restorative discipline in schools, and so I've helped to write some of those. But um, a number of years ago, uh, the editors asked if I would be willing to write one on the little book of restorative justice for parenting. I said, absolutely not would I do that. Um, but, but it's interesting because that keeps coming around. My oldest, uh, who um, is now 31, I remember when I told him they asked, that I was asked to write that, and he was, uh, he was on, he had just gone, come back from, for spring break, so it was the first time he was back from college, and I remember when I told him about this, he said, so mom, what did you tell them? I said, I told them absolutely not. You know, I said, there's way too many times when you kids will tell on me and say, my mom didn't like to bring her work home with her. Like, I didn't practice this at home all the time, uh, as much as I talked about doing it. And he said, well, do you think we've turned out so badly? Like, and I said, oh my goodness, no. I said, you have turned out in spite of the parenting you've had, and I'm thankful for that every day. But again, you know, it's something that I, I really do think that we, ta we need to talk about in our own relationships, um, rather than just what we do to others or for others. So we came up with a number of different um, principles that we talk about. One is that all people should be treated with dignity and respect, and recognize that each person has some piece of the truth. It may not be something we agree with, but it's that piece of the truth, and that's those stories that we try and engage people in and hear. Um, each of us needs to be responsible for our actions and to be held accountable for our actions. I mean, I think if we all do that in our daily lives, how we treat it one another would look very different. Um, this next one was one, by our presence, we're all members of community and therefore connected to one another. One of the things, I did a dialogue a number of years ago uh, with a woman whose son was murdered. And, when we, and Pennsylvania was one of the very first states to have one of these programs. There were about four states that have dialogues and crimes of severe violence. And so there are about 120 facilitators trained across Pennsylvania. We have the training through the Office of the Victim Advocate um, about every other year. And, and facilitators are trained to have these dialogues, and it's only victim initiated. Only victims can ask for it. Those who are incarcerated cannot. Um, so it truly is something that victims have asked for. And so there was a woman, uh, as I said, whose son had been murdered, and she was asking for a dialogue. And I remember asking her, you know, what made you decide that you wanted to have the dialogue with the person who was convicted of killing your son? And this is what she said to me, that we are all connected. She said, I didn't ask for that connection. I didn't want that connection, but I will be connected to this person for the rest of my life because he is the last person to see my son alive. And she said, and I want to talk to him about that. And she did, and they had a six-hour dialogue together. So that one has really struck me that I think if someone can do that in one of the most painful events of their life, then surely we can look for those connections on a daily basis um, in those we're in community with. One of the things I think is really important when we talk about restorative justice is that we also talk about forgiveness, uh, particularly um, for those of us within the faith community, I think restorative justice has often been equated with forgiveness, that idea of forgiveness and reconciliation. And so it's that acknowledgement that not everyone comes to that at the same time. Everyone has a different journey in how they get to that place, if they get to that place. And so wanting to recognize that, that it's not something that's prescriptive. We don't ever engage um, in any process and say, at the end of this, you know, we really want you to hug and say that, you know, you, you, you've forgiven and been forgiven, um, that that's not the point. It often happens, but it's not prescriptive, and so it feels like that's something that we always have to acknowledge. Um, and again, the same with, um, with reconciliation, that that's appropriate and is defined by those who are involved. It's not for us to say whether that happens. One of the things that's really helpful about standing up here is I get to see the clock and I know that I want to give you time for questions. And so I start speeding up. You know, I don't leave anything out. I just speed it up and ratchet it up a notch. My husband says I'm the only one he knows that can do an hour-long speech in half an hour. So get ready because we're going to just keep moving now. Um, so forgiveness, uh, so we talk about some things that restorative justice is not. It's not forgiveness or reconciliation, although it can provide those opportunities. And it's not just mediation, it's not a particular program, it's not a quick fix, and it's not a replacement for the legal system. 
What it is, I think, at the foundation is that we have underlying principles and values, and three of those that we talk about are respect, responsibility, and relationship. So those are kind of those are some of the values that guide us. Uh, there are many more, and again, depending, you know, we could talk about what those values mean because not everyone um, attributes the same kind of definition to all the values. But we do say that it's a value values based approach. And so we start with questions that guide us. We ask who has been hurt. We ask what the needs are and whose obligations are those needs. And then we also ask what are the cause. Often it feels like a Band-Aid. We, and we don't engage in one dialogue or one process and say, well, that'll fix it. You know, that cures it. What are some of those causes that are leading people into the situations where they are? And then what is the process to involve stakeholders? It's not always a dialogue. In some cases, it would be inappropriate. In schools, we talk about how inappropriate it would be when it's a true bullying situation to bring those two together. Um, so we have to talk about what those uh, processes are that would involve um, any kind of uh, a practice, a restorative justice practice. These are just some of the, some of the ways that we, we are looking at restorative justice and how we talk about it. So there, you know, I mentioned some of those, the crimes of severe violence. There's family group conferencing that's also being used. Family group decision making that's used in um, reunification for families when they've been involved with the uh, welfare services. Um, restorative discipline in schools, how we do it in our homes and workplace, and working at restorative justice and law enforcement, which is something that we've just recently uh, been doing more. Uh, the, the dialogue processes is what I, I mentioned earlier, the uh, victim offender conferencing, how it holds people accountable, how it addresses victim needs. Um, I also mentioned the restorative discipline in schools, how we use that for in classrooms, how we use it in relationships. Circles are being used um, it, uh, across the country. There are, in, in Oakland, California, it's now built into their uh, into their school district policy of when something happens or how they're going to operate within their classrooms. And so it's something that's happening throughout the country. Um, we talked about, uh, about doing work in prisons. Um, I mentioned the crimes of severe violence that Pennsylvania was at the forefront. There are about 30 states, probably more than that now, that have some level of, of uh, dialogues in crimes of severe violence where it's victim initiated. Um, we talk about circle processes when they're appropriate. Schools are often used processes of circles, and it's actually where, just like it says, people sit in circles. We often have a talking piece. People get to talk about things that come you know, up for them, whether it's throughout the school day, whether it's something that they bring from home, but important processes for engaging conversations in healthy ways. Um, I think I skipped one. This one was one that just happened last year where there were 12 of us who, this was the first conversation that I'm aware of that happened with a, a large group of law enforcement officers. So these were police chiefs and police officers from Boston to California who gathered together down in Virginia to talk about what does restorative justice really look like within our communities and how do we start implementing it. They are doing some of the dialogue programs, but really wanting to engage that conversation, particularly with some of, the, um, some of what's happening within our communities and who's feeling um, you know, particularly targeted uh, uh, by that. And how do we have those conversations? How do, what does training look like? Um, how do we have those, um, when we feel so polarized, how do we start having those conversations? So I wanna end with this, um, this, this quote, which I love. So this is from uh, DeWitt Jones, is a photographer for National Geographic, and he has this DVD called Celebrate What's, li what's Right with the World. Celebrate what's, I obviously haven't seen that for a while, but it's really wonderful. It's one of those feel good where he just shows his photography and he talks about, it depends on what you focus on. What you focus on with your lens matters. And so he, he goes through a number of different photographs that he's taken and what happens when he uses a wide angle lens, what happens when he narrows that down and what you can see. But one of the things I liked is that he, this is what we do. We say, I won't believe it till I see it. And he says, we have that backwards. If I believe it, I will see it. So that's my feeling about restorative justice. Some of the places where I think it's so unlikely and won't happen, I believe that it can. And when I believe that, then I think that we are more creative in finding ways to see how we can have that happen. Thank you.